Today, I want to tell you about the symbol that's used for one of math's most fundamental operations. That, of course, is addition. Addition, just like the holiday season, is all about bringing things together. Like, if I have one egg and I add a... Oh... If I have one light bulb, if I have one apple and I add two more apples, then all of a sudden I have three apples. And one of the cool things about adding concrete objects is you can see some of the basic properties of this thing called adding. Like, no matter how I assemble these apples, there are still just three of them. I could have it as one apple and two apples, but I could also see another way to express the same quantity as three copies of one. Of course, addition, being bringing things together, also has an evil opposite called subtraction, where we could take things away. We could take away holes, or we could take away parts. Now, as fun as it is to use concrete objects for our mathematics, eventually some really smart people came up with these abstractions of quantities called numbers. Yes, with just a few simple symbols, we can represent numbers easily without having to deal with eggs and light bulbs all the time. Although perhaps I should use some numbers you actually know. Ah yes, the beloved Hindu Arabic numerals. These modern numerals that we use today were invented between the 1st and 4th centuries by Indian mathematicians. Although it wouldn't be until the 1400s that the numerals really began to take shape in the way that we're familiar with them today. But where does the history of the symbol for addition fall into all this? Well, of course, just as with our modern numerals, the symbol for addition was not always a plus sign. The name for this sign, the plus sign, comes from the Latin word plus, which means more. As widely used as this beloved symbol is today, it's perhaps interesting to note that there are various situations where addition is implied without the famous plus sign. For example, this may be written as an elementary problem for a school student to perform. There is no plus sign, but it's understood just by the form of the numbers here that the student is expected to add. 5 plus 2 is 7, and 0 plus 1 is 1, and so we see that 5 plus 12 is 17 without having a plus sign anywhere. Another very common and useful way of writing addition without a plus sign is the sigma symbol. This is the capital Greek letter sigma. The lowercase, if you're curious, looks like that and is used for standard deviation in statistics. But the use of the capital sigma is for adding many things together, which might otherwise be impractical. For example, if we wanted to add the first 100 positive integers, 1 plus 2 plus 3 and so on, all the way up to 100, this would take a while to write out, but it can very easily be written with sigma notation. All we have to do is write that we're going to add all positive integers n from n equals 1 all the way up to 100, and that's what this notation means. Many of you will know that this sum happens to equal 5050, which is of course called a Christmas tree number. That's because if we regarded the numbers in this sum as dots, we could put them in a Christmas tree arrangement. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, and so on, all the way down to a row of 100 dots eventually, and we would have a massive Christmas tree under which you could fit many gifts. Very, very funny. That is what we call a seasonal joke. These are actually called triangular numbers, not Christmas tree numbers. Another infamous example of addition without the plus sign is in what are called mixed numbers. This is a sort of devious language that cooks and first grade teachers speak in. Instead of writing three three plus one half, one of these witches might just write three with a half right next to it. What is that? Three times a half? Nuh-uh. This is three plus one half written with no plus sign. These things, of course, are called mixed numbers because it's a mix of a fraction with a whole. And a lot of people, myself included, aren't huge fans of these things. But instead of talking about these weird ways addition can be written without a symbol, let's talk more about addition with symbols. At over 3,000 years old, the Rhind Papyrus is one of the oldest mathematical documents known to exist today. 
The Rhine Papyrus is an ancient Egyptian math document dated to around 1550 BC. And according to a journal article in the American Mathematical Monthly, on the Rhine Papyrus you can see Egyptians using walking legs as an addition symbol, something that looks kind of like that. I wasn't able to find any other sources talking about this symbol, and it also looks very much like another symbol that Egyptians used for a particular number, which which makes matters even more confusing. But you can see that these legs are walking from left to right. Now, Egyptian hieroglyphics could be written left to right or right to left, so the legs to indicate addition would apparently be written to walk in whatever the direction of the writing was to indicate addition. However, they could be written in the opposite direction to indicate subtraction. So if we were writing from left to right, this could be addition, but if we were writing the other way, then we might write something like this for addition, which would of course be subtraction in a left to right manuscript. I will say I'm very grateful we're not using those symbols today. If I was to write something like 1 plus negative 2 using the legs, oh god, what would that look like? Let's see, 1 plus negative 2. Oh my god, that is disgusting. Now, if we fast forward about 3,000 years from the Rhine Papyrus, we get to Luca Pacioli in 1494. He released a compendium of mathematics. In his comprehensive text titled Summa de Arithmetica Geometria Proportione et Proportionalita, he used a P with an overline as the symbol for addition. The reasoning behind this symbol for addition was the Italian word PU, which meant to add a foul odor. That is a stupid joke, of course. This word just meant more. Now, for a while, mathematics was in a sort of rhetorical phase where problems were posed with words and they were solved with words, and so the need for symbols was just not as significant. So where did our plus sign come from? Well, it's believed to have come from the Latin word this is a conjunction meaning and, which of course would make sense in the context of addition. You of course may particularly recognize it from the phrase et cetera, which means and other similar things, which is also put at the end of a list. The use of et cetera at the end of a list of examples has resulted in several humorous memes. In these memes, somebody who uses et cetera to obscure the fact that they are not well educated on the subject they're discussing and thus actually don't know any more examples, but are hiding that with the etc. They are framed as the hero in these memes, the scrappy underdog. On the other hand, etc. can be viewed as a sort of angel saving these folks from exposing themselves. You can tell me what your favorite etc. meme was down in the comments. The plus sign derived from et was used in various forms leading up to the 16th century, but it wasn't until 1518 that it was used in the sense that we know today. It was used by a German fellow named Henricus Grammatius in an arithmetic book he wrote. I can't find any pictures that I'm confident are portrayals of him, but this is a woodprint edition of his arithmetic book. Finally though, in 1557, our boy Robert Record introduced the plus sign in Britain. Robert is very well known for his introduction of the equals sign, and he has his hands all over our mathematical notation. Now, how is the plus sign used today? Well, you may be interested to know that it's written with what we call infix notation, fixed in between the two numbers which are to be added, like this, 5 plus 3 equals, oh, you can't see that, can you, equals 8, just like that. I'm a little self-conscious about my pluses, which is why I've printed this one out, but it is a bit impractical. Now, oftentimes when doing addition, the things being added are called add-ins or sum-ands. Another term that's less popular these days is for the first thing in the sum to be called an augend. Of course, the fact that we can add things in whatever order we desire without changing the result makes the use of a specific word for the first thing in the sum a little bit pointless. In this context, the plus symbol is being used as what's called a binary operator, by meaning two, and so this is operating on two numbers. It's bringing two numbers together. Occasionally though, the plus sign may also be used as a unary operator, operating on only a single number. 
For example, consider this parabola, which I've drawn on the xy plane. Suppose the parabola crosses the horizontal axis at, let's say that's positive two, and over here we'll say that's negative two. These are called the roots of the parabola, or the zeros, and if I were to write them out, I may choose to write them as minus two and plus two, thus using the plus symbol as a unary operator. It's not actually adding two to anything, but it's here to indicate the positiveness of this two in contrast to the negativeness of this two. Of course, in this particular context, one may also use the more fanciful symbol of plus or minus. There's also a Jewish tradition in many Israeli schools and elementary textbooks to not use the traditional plus sign for addition, but rather use what looks like an, in an inverted T to avoid writing a symbol that looks like the Christian cross. I can certainly imagine some confusion using this symbol in conjunction with some more sophisticated algebraic notation like the absolute value of the floor of capital L plus the ceiling of H, perhaps. Now, one of the great things about the plus sign is that it's not just used for traditional addition of these abstractions called numbers. Addition has a few very important key properties, and so the plus sign is used throughout mathematics for other operations that resemble addition. Perhaps the most important properties of addition are firstly that it is commutative. This means the order in which we plus things together does not change the result. It is associative, which means if we're plussing more than two things together, we can group them however we please. So if we have A plus B plus C, it's perhaps not obvious how this should be done, but we have to pick two things to add together first, and it doesn't matter which two we pick. We could pick A and B to add first, and that would be the same as if we had picked B and C to add first. This is important because it means we can actually write the addition of many things without having to include the parentheses. Even without the parentheses, the expression isn't ambiguous because it doesn't matter how you carry out the addition. Addition, as we traditionally use it with our numbers, also has an identity, a very special number that when added to anything else leaves it unchanged. Of course, that number is zero. If we add zero to a, or we do it in the other order, zero plus a, we just get a. A's identity is preserved. Addition, of course, also has inverses. If I have a number, there's another number called an inverse that I can add to it to produce zero, that very special identity number. If I have the number A, all I have to do is add negative A to get our very special friend zero back out. Of course, in the context of addition, we typically call these negatives rather than inverses. One of the most common types of addition in mathematics outside of our typical number addition is a vector addition. This is really important in physics, of course, as well as many other places. Vectors are quantities with both direction and magnitude, and so they're often represented as arrows, since an arrow has a length, a magnitude, and of course a direction. If this was a vector called A, and this was a vector called B, we could perform vector addition on them. To perform vector addition, all we have to do is take one of them, so here I'm going to redraw the vector A, and then draw the other one from the tip of the first one, so it's like I'm adding B to A. A, there's B. Then to actually get the result of the addition, just start from the beginning of the first vector and go to the end of the second vector. That there is A plus B. We then immediately see a connection between vectors, vector addition, and triangles. Of course, vector addition has all of those key properties of numerical addition I described earlier. We can, for example, get an idea of the commutativity of vector addition by just drawing this again in the different order. So there's the vector b, and then I can attach the vector a to it like that, and then adding them together, we get a plus b. And you can see that this vector, a plus b, looks just like it did before. Another common type of addition, which is very familiar to our numerical addition, is the addition of matrices. A matrix is a rectangular grid of numbers. These two matrices have the same size. They're two rows by two columns, and so we can add them together. 
and the addition works exactly as you would expect. To add two matrices together, you just add their corresponding entries. So we would get one plus four, which is five, zero plus one, which is one, three plus negative three, which is zero, and negative two plus one, which is negative one. Matrices have tons of applications, but one of the most common ways a mathematician would perceive a matrix actually is a transformation on a vector, like what we were looking at before. Even though these just look like rectangular grids of numbers, they can actually move and spin vectors all around the Cartesian plane. It's really cool. You may be familiar with binary numbers, which are numbers written in base two. These will thus consist only of zeros and ones. A type of addition that's done between binary numbers is something called the bitwise exclusive or. Sometimes it's called the XOR operation. If we're adding two binary numbers with the exclusive or operation, all we have to do is compare what are called their bits. That's the base two word for digits. If the two Two corresponding bits are distinct, then we get a 1 in the resulting number. These two bits are distinct, so we get a 1. These two bits are distinct, so we get a 1. These two bits are distinct, so we get a 1. These two bits are distinct, so we get a 1. And if the two bits are not distinct, we get a 0. A guy by the name Edward Vermilly Huntington in 1904 actually used a very cool symbol for this, not the plus sign, but in fact the plus sign in a circle. One of the neat things about bitwise XOR is if you take a binary number and XOR it to itself, it's going to zero out. For example, 11001, and we use the XOR operation with itself. What does this produce? Well, these two bits are the same, so zero. These two bits are the same, zero. Well, hey, all the bits are the same, so it's all zeros. Of course, in this context, the number is its own additive inverse, viewing this as our addition operation. Anyway, that's some interesting stuff about the plus sign. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet.